This is Python's Paradise. This is your host, Greg Gilbert, a.k.a. the Python Hyena, straight out of Fredericton, New Brunswick, Canada. And here we are, October 18th, 2021. And I have a special guest on the show. I got to credit uh, Joe. So Joe Williamson? Yeah. Okay. Passes me by over my head here. He's the one that connected me with you, my guest. Harley Wallen. How do you do, Harley? I'm good, Greg. How about you? Yeah, Joe is uh, my manager and publicist. Real, real, uh, real good guy. One of the rare ones out in LA that uh, you can legitimately shake hands with and, and trust, trust what they say. Well, you know what? They are far and few between. I've had a few good ones that uh, have connected me with people. Yeah. And then there are the... Uh, the shaky ones and i've dealt yeah. with them too i've had a few yeah. already where i've had to have interviews this summer and they still haven't got back to me despite uh you know me reaching out and then they respond and say this and that and then nothing ha i've had that happen more than once wow yeah well i i, I guess that it, it does happen but uh, at, at least we're on, so that's good. Yes, absolutely. And of course, you're a filmmaker and you're an actor. Uh, I was wondering before we get into your projects, if you would yeah. give a little bit of your background and how you get into the business. So um, as a kid, I was always into arts of all kinds. I, I used to draw a lot. I used to do uh, graffiti. I used to be a break dancer. I was a martial artist and and um I, I even made some music as a singer and as a as a rapper so uh i tried my my ways in all kinds of different arts and crafts so to speak um and then i ended up on a on a on a tv show in sweden where it's uh, almost like a cabaret like the osmonds or something mm -hmm. and um i was on there uh because we had a lot of musical guests and essentially they brought in us to to do dances and numbers to the uh to the to the people they brought in and um when they had like one-liners and stuff like that instead of bringing in an actor specifically they sometimes came over to us and asked if we'd be interested but when you start doing acting you start hanging out with actors and then you realized what acting is which i had no idea and it was so fascinating to start hanging out with them and then you start talking about acting coaches and how do you do this and how do you do that? What's your process? And suddenly I found myself um, just really loving acting. I think I've never learned, learned as much about myself as when I play other characters because you compare why they make decisions why you make decisions, why they, they do what they do and why you do what you do. And it's a lot easier to see openly at yourself when you're an actor. So that was big for me. Um, the filmmaking part didn't come till way later. Um, I'm the kind of person that likes to pay attention. So as an actor on set, I'm always listening to what they're talking about behind the scenes and on the other side of the camera. I always look at the lighting setups uh, and I'm fascinated by that as well. So I'd really been paying attention and uh, started going well for me with acting. I was in uh, Batman vs. Superman, it was a, a small role. Um, sadly, ended up getting uh, uncredited on that one eventually. But uh, but it, but I was supposed to at first play the referee for the underground fight scene and then something else. But anyways, um, did that gig and, and thought that I was going to have more bigger roles coming. And Michigan, which is where I'm at, uh, we cut our film incentives, and suddenly my hope of having all this was kind of like pulled from underneath me, and. Uh, we didn't really have a very viable uh, independent film community here when that happened. So um, my my film partner on the production that we were on, uh, Walbert and I, we sat down and talked and I went to my wife and I said, you know what, um, you know, I, I kind of feel like I want to do something with this. I feel like I've been almost called to to put my name in the hat and make a movie. I said, what do you say? We give it a go. We make a short film and enter this festival. Um, and, and that was where it all started. Uh, uh, and uh, I, I ended up doing uh, 
Rocket Jump, uh, which is an online film school. And I'm, I'm big on telling people about this because most people, when they look at filmmaking, they look at a dreaded big college giant expense uh, going to film school uh, to get that side of the pedigree, so to speak. In today's world, there are other options for the people that want to give it a go. So, uh, so I always like to, to at least plug that. Uh, Rocket Jump was amazing for me, and it's a way to, to learn at your own pace. So if you're really, really into it, you want to study you know, day and night, you can work your way through this a lot quicker. Awesome. Um, looking through your, uh, your credits, it's like I bring them up here. Let me see, I'm gonna click. Okay, I had to click on because uh, I was researching you last night and uh, you mentioned your wife. Um, yeah. Is it Katie Wallen? Yeah. Uh, it's funny because I've seen her her name or like her picture in all your movies and it, and it just kind of hit me. You two were uh, married. How did yeah. you meet? How did you meet her? Oh, God, it's the funniest story ever, because anybody who's seen a picture of my wife, if mm -hmm. I said we met at a modeling event, everybody would go, oh, so she was modeling and you were in the crowd uh, watching her. <laughs> and it was actually a, a it's called rock the runway which is a charity event and i was the model and she was the bartender for that night and uh, it was really odd we uh we uh hit it off and i i kept going back to her bar even though it was not like super convenient because it was up by where uh, all of us were hanging out before the show but after you walked through with your stuff you hung out downstairs trying to get the uh, trying to get people to donate because it's a good charity. Um, so, so, so that's kind of where everybody else was hanging out. And I was up at the, at the bar hanging out with uh, who later became my wife, but it was really a, a wild thing because they, we just clicked right out of the gate um, and kind of been together ever since. I think we, uh, we met in December. We started dating the following January and we got married that year in November. So like literally we were together for 11 months before we tied the knot, uh, which is pretty wild. But yeah, we we really clicked. And it's uh, it's uh, like we're best friends. We're business partners. We, we do like everything uh, together. It's pretty cool. Wow. Because uh, after this interview, I would love to book her on here to talk about the projects as well. Do you think she'd be yeah. up for that? Okay. Oh, for sure. Because I, I kind of like looked at that and I was like, here's other interview opportunities. So, yeah. yep. Okay. So you, like I said, her name pops up in almost all your movies. Yeah. So out of the movies you've directed her in, what are some of the, what, what are your favorite performances you had her in? Oh, God, there's so many of them. And, and the thing, too, is I've always pushed her really hard mm -hmm. um, because I know ultimately, like, she is the kind of person that would love to at some point, you know, stand there with an Oscar in her hands. So, so I know how important it is for her to, to go. Um, but I remember Betrayed to me was very, very uh, important because – we were making a film about human trafficking and um, she was really drawn to play the detective. And I, and I just didn't see her at all as the detective. And we pretty much agreed on all the roles up until that point. But when it came to Betrayed, she wanted to play something different. I don't think she really wanted to be as vulnerable as, as that character would mean to be because not, not only she's the, she's the mayor's daughter and the mayor's dirty, and she's kind of a young, somewhat rebellious uh, uh, lady, and she kind of gets herself in trouble. And then you kind of get to see the, what happens when, when you play with fire. And I, I think she was really afraid of that role, but it also made her excellent. Some of the, some of the scenes we had our, our, our crew, you know, crying behind the scenes, uh, because of what we kind of had to go through emotionally 
to, sh to do the scenes. There's a scene where they're trying to get out of their cages and escape. And, um, and, and it was pretty torturous to watch this because th there are several young women locked up in, in uh, you know, dog cages. And, and it was just, it was pretty hard to watch. Mm -hmm. Did you like working with Richard Tyson? I love Richard. Like Richard and I have become such good buddies by now. He's been in so many of my projects. Um, he he's he's a he's he's a riot. First of all, he is just he's he's funny. Uh, if you ever watched him in comedies, you can kind of see it. Uh, he's oh, also yeah. like when it comes to a trained actor, this guy will do Hamlet, like on spot on set, just you know theater in front of the the cast and crew. Still knows his stuff, man. He's a talented dude. Um, but but yeah, he's he's a he's a riot. He's a blast. I've I've been blessed. I've had him in, I think, four of my projects now. And I just uh, last year was in Denver on a project as well uh, with Richard. So uh, we're really that was uh, actually a big blast. Um, those guys out in Denver really putting it together. You had uh, Vernon Wells, me and Richard Tyson in a scene together. I was like, wow, you guys are killing it. I've interviewed Vernon twice, and I met him at Horror Rama 2017. So, <laughs> yeah. Awesome dude, too. Very, very yep. cool. Oh yeah, like you—you would never think that these people were big stars. They're so down to earth. Uh, you can just hang out with them and, and be yourself. You don't have to, you know, dress anything up. You can just have a blast with them. Oh, Vernon's great. He's involved yeah. in a film that um, I have my name on too, called Social Distance. So. Oh, cool. Yeah. Yeah. Vernon's a great guy. I enjoyed, like I said, I was at Horror Rama. I was assisting one of the other guests who invited me to the event. And uh, Vernon Wells' table is just kind of adjacent to ours. And I was like chatting it up with him whenever his table wasn't too busy, you know, which yeah. was kind of rare for him. Yeah. So, yeah. But um, yeah. But awesome, dude. Great presence, that guy on screen. Like, holy smokes, he's that intense. When you're acting across from him, too, he's mm -hmm. so intense. He barely blinks, man. He's he's incredible. Well, let's go way back. Uh, we're going to talk yeah. about your director, Phil. Deceitful. That was your first feature, according to IMDb. Yeah. What was it like uh, um, doing, uh, doing your first feature? Because I know prior to that, you did shorts. Yeah. And to be honest with you, Deceitful was supposed to have been a long short, and we were supposed to uh, essentially test how well we knew our stuff when it came to, it's a, it's a more of an action thriller, and, uh, and we really wanted to go after it. This was before film school for me, uh, so I'm still kicking myself a lot over some of the performances in that one. Um, some, of my, uh, some of my cinematography wasn't the way I would have liked it, but uh, it was a great learning experience. And I will tell anyone, when you get the opportunity to make a feature, um, it, it is gonna test everything about you, everything, um, because it, it's a grind. To, to, to make a full feature, to go bumper to bumper, uh, it, it's a ton of work. So I'm really happy that we did it, but it was a, a learning experience for me where I figured out some of the things I know, but but I also realized that I, I needed more schooling type of training or it would be a long road for me to become an effective director. You followed that up with moving parts. Now, yeah. the transition from uh, Deceitful to moving parts, um, did you feel yourself improving? Were there things you, or like... Um, I'm going to assume you move forward, like you you uh, improve with, of course, experience. Yeah, experience and that that uh, rocket jump film school was in between those two, uh, because I, when we were shooting Deceitful between me and Walbert, who co-directed that one, um, I, I just saw that we were not we were not as good as we should have been. Um, so I, I immediately jumped into that. And then I also brought on uh, a friend and a mentor who is a director called Jerry Hayes, 
who mm-hmm. co-directed moving parts with me. And it was really nice to see somebody who's directed, you know, multiple feet, uh, feature films before uh, who could kind of take me under his wing. And, and, and some of the lessons that you don't get in, in school, you, you need to get on set. Uh, and he was really good at providing me with, uh, with uh, just when to do what, um, where I didn't always have the right sense of, of when uh, uh, you should use a specific shot and what it actually tells the audience. Uh, or I would sometimes get lost in the action and forget about who in this scene are we feeling for? Who do we care about? Who do we kind of need to begin and end on? Um, those little things that I didn't really know as well before, uh, I, I learned a, a lot during during that shoot. I'm seeing the name uh, Calhoun Coig a lot. Um, she is, she's a regular of yours, huh? Yeah, yeah, Calhoun. Uh, fantastic uh, actress and, and she's been uh, she's been really up and coming and having some cool opportunities uh, at some of the big stuff uh, but yes yeah, she started uh, with us uh, we were in a TV series called I declare war mm-hmm. um, uh, together and uh, I just she's just such a fantastic actor that I, I wanted to make sure that I that, that we kept in contact and funny enough for her mother Nancy Oswine um, uh, was a makeup artist and she was really good with organization and everything else. So uh, she started co-producing with me and my wife and Walbert and, and we got access to a really fantastic actress as well. So we were just lucky all the way around with, 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 with her. And, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll say, I'll call this one right now. Watch out for Callie. She's going to be, uh, she's a fantastic actress. She's going to have some big opportunities ahead. Well, I'm looking at uh, Bennett's song on here right now. Mm-hmm. And of course, you get to work with Tara Reid, of course, mm-hmm. of American Pie fame. Yeah. Uh, talk about this film and working with Tara. Uh, working with Tara was a lot of fun. Um, and it's kind of funny because uh, as a director, when you bring people in, especially from Hollywood, you, you either do it with uh, you know people that you have connections to or 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 indirect connections to and uh and i didn't have that with tara nancy had a connection with with someone that was connected to tara so so that's how we ended up getting her but i but it was really cool because uh when we picked them up from the airport and i met with her at at her hotel talking about the character and everything else the night before to see somebody who's been in, in giant films have genuinely read the script, the entire script, mm-hmm. knew her character, uh, had had uh, uh, notes on dialogue where she wanted to make some adjustments. Uh, it was refreshing for me to see somebody at that level take an independent film that serious. Uh, and, and it shows that that film has been on Fuse, um, and uh, Super Channel, and, and it's a little indie film sold several times to, to network. So it, it's pretty cool. And, and I, I say thanks to, to both Tara and Dennis Haskins, Mr. Belding uh, from, from uh, Bennett's Song. And that film was such a challenge with so many kids, uh, uh, but it was so much fun. Well, you've got a film here called, um, forgive me if I butcher this title, Agramon's Gate? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. My very first dabble into horror. And uh, I have a few different influences. And I kind of wanted to pay homage to some of the greats before me. Agramon's Gate, I think, um, it's really placed, like if you remember the movie Fallen with Denzel Washington, Mm -hmm. it has the supernatural layer. It has a lot of suspense. Uh, It has some jumps, but it has mystery. I think mystery is one of them things that's often lost in horror films these days. So Mm -hmm. I wanted to combine those elements uh, when it came to this, because some of those films that I watched, you know, when I was younger, whether it was, uh, you know, The Exorcist or if it's, uh, uh, poltergeist. I, I loved the fact that I didn't know what, what I was afraid of. Um, and, and that was pretty cool. Uh, and, and, and some of that was brought out in Agramon's gate. That was a lot of fun. And I got to work with, uh, 
um, Jan Birch, the stairmaster from the people under the stairs, uh, mm -hmm. in a pretty significant role. And he's he's a special guy. Uh, I don't think Hollywood has ever given him the nod to to play some of the roles that I've been able to get him uh, get him in because he he's a really strong actor. And uh, uh, he's even in my TV series. He plays a drug dealer in my TV series, and it's uh, it's wild to see. But in Agramon's Gate we're going after that demonic horror, the, uh, the supernatural thing where you're not real sure of who is who and, and what you're afraid of. Yeah. It looks like you got a bigger budget for this. Yeah. Yeah. We, uh, we started coming, um, I think with betrayed and beyond betrayed, the budgets got a little bit bigger and we had a little bit, a uh, little bit more to play with, which is really nice. Talk about your wife being in this. How, what was her role in this film? So she played, uh, they were a young couple that just moved into this house. Um, and uh, what we don't know is that her newly husband um, has uh, some pretty emotional baggage that he's never really talked about. But essentially, uh, he killed his father when he was a kid. Uh, because his, his dad started kind of going Amityville on them and ended up shooting him with his own gun. Mm -hmm. uh, and the hardest part about that, the, the trauma of, of being able of having to kill your own dad was so heavy. Uh, but on top of it, his mother pretty much disowned him uh, because of what he did. And she thought that the spirit who was in her, her husband went into the kid and that's what made him kill him. So she has been in a mental institution ever since. Uh, and this kid has been raised in foster care and now is pretty much trying to pretend that it never happened almost. And, 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 and that keeps haunting him in this film uh, because of the, the, the demon that comes, uh, comes in the shape of his father. And you worked with Kayla Kelly. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Kayla's Kayla's awesome. She's had a, a real big uh, bump here. Um, and it was funny when we saw her audition because um, it's she's a Michigan actress. And, and I always get surprised when I see a really strong Michigan actress and I don't know about him. I remember when she auditioned, I, I looked at Katie. I'm like, how have we not seen her before? She's really good. And of course, Lorraine Landon, who's got a, a, a past in uh, cult films. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. She was in Maniac Cop, uh, Airplane Two, I believe she was in, and uh, she yeah, she's had quite a few cult film type of performances, and she still has that. Her performance in Agramont's Gate is literally like your 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 goose. You're you're gonna you're gonna feel it. She she speaks right into and chills your bones uh, because she plays that crazy lady incredibly well how did you get her cast so we actually have the same manager joe williamson and i oh, okay um, yeah our, 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 was also laureen's manager at the time and uh and essentially i i i went to joe and i said i think i have something perfect for her and uh and we ended up we ended up uh tying the knot uh, and she was fantastic. She did such a good job. Uh, I, I think you can almost feel it. If you watch the trailer, you can feel her when she comes up and she's like, you're all going to die. And uh, everybody's like, oh, my goodness, that's intense. Does Joe still represent her? Uh, no, no, oh, okay. he does not. Yeah. Yeah. I, I know Joe has uh, picked up a few filmmakers mm -hmm. and uh, and uh, I think keeping us busy uh makes uh makes makes it hard enough for him to keep uh to keep tabs on all of us okay and uh and i know that she had uh, other representation as well so um yeah well i'm still good friends with laureen though so if you want to get that hookup i'd, yeah, I'd love yeah I, I i would She's love fantastic. to yeah. Yeah, yeah i would love to yeah i'd like and i'd like to get your wife on here too at some point for sure yep Yep, because that gives you more promotion on your films. See, I haven't seen any of your work, but I'm one of these people. I don't turn people down. 
uh-huh. because notice between you and your wife and Lorraine, I, I'm, I'm seeing all these opportunities here. Yeah. And of course this benefits your film. So, uh, yeah. Yep. I I'm just honored to be able to do this, you know? So, yeah. uh, so, um, you have a, a next film I want to tap in is eternal code. Uh, mm-hmm. you got Richard Tyson back. <laughs> yeah. And, and you got scout, T- uh, Taylor Compton, of course, of, uh, Rob Zombie's Halloween, not the biggest fan, you know. I like I like the original Halloween, you know. Yeah. Um, you know, but Scout is still one of those people. Uh, yeah. Talk about working with her. You know, it's really cool. Um, the crazy thing is the role she ended up getting two and a half, three weeks before uh, that that was supposed to be. Uh, 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 what's his name? Uh, Busey, uh, mm-hmm. not 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 the fathers, the son, uh, and uh, and he ended up being on set uh, at the time shooting uh, Stranger Things, and uh, and something came up on set. They had an accident, and and he calls me, and he's like, Harley, you're gonna hate me because I I, I just get pushed, and this is gonna infringe on the dates that I'm supposed to be in Detroit with you. So I'm like, shit, Jake, what are you, what is this? You know what I mean? Like, how am I going to replace you? It's not even three weeks out. And, um, and I'm like, don't worry about it. I'll figure it out. So I call Jan because he's a, such a good friend of mine. And, and, and we, we do a lot of the stuff that when it comes to producing, I, I, I go to him when it comes to cast and everything else, because he's so well connected in Hollywood. And, um, uh, and we were talking through some options of who could play that character. And I just wasn't happy with anyone. And he goes, it's too bad it can't be a girl because Scout would kill that role. And I go, whoa, 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 Hank, what? And, and, and I thought to myself, why does, that, why does that character have to be a, a, a dude? It, it doesn't have to. So, uh, so that's kind of how it ended up going. Jan ended up connecting me. I sent her the script and I'm like, ignore that it's a guy. Um, this will be very easily written over and then i started thinking about some of the stuff uh with the plot for that character actually plays better being a woman oh wow and and she actually ended up killing it and she was a blast to work with uh we were just down um at uh fright fest in kentucky and um and saw scout she's doing so well yeah i've never had her on here but um I'm familiar with her. I think that's pretty cool. You wrote that as a male, and she, I think that is very cool. And you had Richard Tyson back, and you got Yom back. Like I can, and Bill Billy Worth from the Lost Boys too. Yep, Billy Worth, and your wife is in this now. What role did she play in this? So in Eternal Code, you're never going to believe this, but she plays a prostitute, which is a funny thing to ask your wife to play. Uh, it, 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 you never know if that's going to go over very well. But uh, what I wanted with that film was, uh, you know, when I wrote the script for that, I had read an article about uh, this Italian researcher, and he was essentially in the process of decapitating uh, a brain dead person and a paraplegic person and switch out the good head onto the good body. And, and, um, and I was just fascinated by it. Um, supposedly, he had already done this on deceased primates um, to see if he could get stuff to reattach. And he believed that with a medical coma, he could. And I started thinking to myself, how close are we to this holy grail? And I started playing with the idea. And in Eternal Code, essentially what they do is they figure out a way to download you onto a drive and then plug it into another human. And uh, I, I love playing with moral dilemmas because um, it just makes you think, how far are we willing to go to get what we want? Um, I believe the, the log line for the film is, would you kill to live forever? And, uh, and it's, it's a fascinating thing to think about because I think we're, we, we all look at ourselves as good humans, um, and, and I think some people, when it comes to um, the gray little, the murky waters, 
are probably very willing to go there. And this is why these conspiracies and, uh, and things come up. Um, so many people are talking about how many hearts are we on now with uh, uh, the senior Rothschild. Uh, uh, it, it, is a, it is an intriguing thing to think about. If we can figure out this holy grail, what will the richest of the rich do with that? Uh, will they be ethical? Will, will they be, will it be for all? Should we even be playing God? There's so many things about it that I really love. And I think that film um, really touches on that. You know, um, what's it like directing yourself in these movies? So it's, it's a really tricky thing. And, and one of the things that a lot of, I, I haven't really talked about this a whole lot, but my first AD uh, directs his own content. Mm -hmm. My cinematographer, my, my, my director of photography, he's a director, both skilled uh, directors that I really respect. So to have their eyes when I have to step in um, is really helpful. But I have a, a little test for myself. Usually I know that when I kind of lose myself in a scene, then, then usually things have gone well. Um, uh, there's nothing better than hearing cut and going, oh yeah, that's right, this is not real. <laughs> We're just playing pretend uh, because you get so into it. You're so a part of what's happening um, and, and the camera just have to capture you. Uh, uh, that that's my favorite. That's when you really don't need to ask uh, how it went when you when you lose yourself in a scene. Now, where I'm familiarizing myself with your work, you mentioned you had directed your wife to play a prostitute in that last movie. Yeah. Um, have you ever? And this is an interesting question because I often, when I hear about, like for example, of. Um, Okay, I'll 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 approach it this way. Have you ever directed your wife to do romantic scene with somebody? And if yes. you have, okay, what? Because I, I I would think about, for example, if uh, in the business, and I've heard uh, Howard Stern talk about this. Mm -hmm. You know, guys that have wives in the porn industry. I'm not saying yours is, but you get my point. Oh yeah, no. Where and they just kind of accept it, you know, or these people that um, are involved with somebody in the industry and they show up at the premiere and there's a significant other on screen uh, in a love scene. And um, I find it fascinating, the mindset on that, you know, um, how do you, uh, direct your wife doing that? How do you broach it to her? Actually, tell me about first broaching it to her. What film did you first broach that to her if you've done it? The, the first time she played anything romantic was in Moving Parts. Mm -hmm. uh, and she had scenes with, uh, it's a, that's, it's, by the way, that's a, a crime love triangle. Mm -hmm. It's the kind of movie where you want to be a detective when you watch it and try to, to solve the mystery. But in that movie, she kisses a guy and she has uh, kissing scenes with two women as well. Okay. Um, so that was an interesting one to go with. But here's the thing. To me, it's kind of funny when people get so um, focused on... Um, she's also shooting people and stabbing them with knives mm -hmm. and nobody goes, how was it directing your wife killing somebody? It's just as fake as the, the sex or the kissing or whatever. Um, anyone who's done romantic scenes themselves know that it's, it's not fun in all honesty, because you have a whole camera crew around you. You don't want to get, excited because you don't want to offend the other person that you're with that we're there working you know mm -hmm. and, and, and so but you also don't want to be it's, it's a weird it's a very weird thing and literally uh, most people somewhat dread it but it is an important portion of storytelling because it, it humanizes you when you see that on screen because 
it connects you to a person on a deeper level, which makes you believe in the character even more. It makes you go along for the ride even harder. So it's a piece that, that I understand why it's used in film. Um, and it's really no different than, uh, than directing anything else. Um, and I also think, you know, if you're insecure about your own stuff, then it will affect stuff on set. If you're not insecure uh, and you're not like worried about them sneaking off with somebody, I mean, then you shouldn't be together. So mm -hmm. to me, it's really no different uh, having a, 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 a spicy scene or having her like to me, there's a scene in Betrayed where she's going to try to get out of the cage um, by sweet talking the guy because she she knows she's not going to be able to fight him. So her only kind of way to get out is to befriend this this Russian guard um, and, and try to get him to like her enough that maybe she can get an opportunity to get away. Nothing happens. That was probably worse to see than anything else because it was so intimate on a, on a different level how she had to peel these layers off herself and do something that's very much against uh, who she is just to try to break free. Uh, so that was really impactful for me. Uh, I think uh, in Eternal Code, these girls try to, uh, to save one of these young girls by themselves, probably being a little bit too courageous and one of the hookers end up getting shot and killed. And, and same thing because of her character kind of taking it on to try to be a hero and, and falling short. Uh, those are harder, the big heartbreaks, because those as an actor, you have to, you have to fully go through your heart breaking. And these things have to, they're, they're more impactful. The sex scene stuff and whatever, you really just want to get as few takes as possible and get and move on. Okay. No, that 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 does an interesting answer. Yep. Yeah. Okay. I'm gonna go on to your next uh, film on here because you are advertising these to me, <laughs> so I can look these up. Yep. We have Enigma. Yeah, Enigma was actually, uh, Enigma and Abstruse were released later, but they were very early films. They were actually uh, features number three and four, rather than uh, in this, uh, it, it, they are like six and seven or something like that. Um, uh, and, and Enigma was a fun ride because it was the first time we had, you know, a couple of investors saying, all right, let's see what you can do. Um, so that was, that was fun. We brought in, uh, Dennis Haskins again, Mr. Belding from Saved mm -hmm. by the Bell and, uh, a good friend of mine, TJ Storm, who was in moving parts with me. And, um, uh, and it was, it was a really good ride. It was a fun movie to shoot. Mm -hmm. Uh, same thing played with the supernatural. Um, I wasn't gutsy enough to go horror on that film. Um, it's more of a thriller than anything. Um, but it was it was it was a fun ride. Okay. So, uh, and you say obtuse was the same thing. Okay, third obtuse was film. I worked with Tom Sizemore, which was you know oh yes quite the experience. Uh, this guy's one of the best actors I've ever seen. He's just special. It's amazing. You you uh, you really don't realize what an actor is until you see somebody at that level you know when he i remember when he sat down on screen um i remember sitting on my director's monitor going holy smokes like he just he just like that became the character and it just blew my mind and and you just saw it every everything about him was the character and and it, it was effortless it looked effortless i know it's not i know you know, you read that script a thousand times. I know, I know what goes into it, but he just made it look so easy and he's so present and he does these little things that just add, you know, 10 pounds of weight to every scene. I, and I remember that was the first time I got to really see a high-end actor work 
up close for several days and to, to, to direct him. Um, and he's funny to direct too, because uh, he, he fights for every scene. He wants every scene, like everything is so important to him. There's a scene in this film because he plays the father actually of my wife um, and he's confronting this, this guy who has killed uh, uh, Katie's friend in the film. And I think he's thinking that he's running into this guy and he's a punk and he's not. This guy is a scary, scary dude. So when he realizes this dude is really scary, he has to kind of reassess everything about him. And these guys, Chris uh, Riley and Tom Sizemore, they were going toe to toe. And every time we shot that scene, Tom would not let uh, Chris win. He, Tom had to leave the winner. And I'm like, Tom, stop, stop, stop. I'm like, the only way this works is if he wins now. Chris has to win now so you can win the, the war later, but he has to win this battle. And he's like, it's just driving me crazy because he's like, I don't want to be afraid of him. And I'm like, I know you don't want to, but this is who he is. He is this emerging psycho um, who, who's just killed somebody. And, and, he's, and he did it in cold blood. So you have to take that in. And, and when you realize that he's not this punk spoiled kid, when you realize that he's psycho, you have to let him have this because you weren't ready for that. So eventually, I think on take seven, he gave me, he gave me a, a two takes where, where he let th that happen so that it worked for the film. But it was funny because this battle on screen um, is very real. When you see that scene with them two, you'll see what I'm talking about. They were so intense. They were nose to nose. And, and uh, I was almost like, whoo, this could, this could, this could really go because they're so on fire. I'm looking through the pictures of, I'm stupid. I was looking through these last night. Uh, there was, there was a funny picture on here of uh, Jesse Jensen. <laughs> she's got a, a ball gag and she's grinning at it. Did you see yeah. that behind? <laughs> yeah yeah Interesting the, reactions yeah yeah it was really funny we decided that we so in this film after he kidnaps jesse um he essentially carries her around with him with a ball ball gag in her mouth um almost as insurance policy and uh but yeah he uh, when i wrote abstruse I actually wrote it. Chris auditioned for a role in Enigma that was so incredibly good, but it wasn't at all for the role in Enigma. And I actually wrote Abstruse based on that audition. That audition drove me to write an entire script um, because that crazy that he showed me was almost, I felt the emergence of Psycho. Um, and, and that's kind of what that film is to me it's kind of how he became to some degree. Talk about Katie's uh, role in this film. Yeah, so she plays, uh, 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 you know, uh, Sizemore's daughter. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and what was so cool about this one was uh, her and her friends are bartenders. They're young, they're naive. So you have the Senator's son coming over saying, hey, you guys should come over. I want to do a test shoot with, uh, with uh, uh, you know, uh, your friend and you guys can hang out. Um, uh, and he essentially makes them believe that he's going to turn, turn them into, um, you know, actors and, and this and that. And I think they get a little bit seduced by the idea. But at the end of the night, he kills the one girl. And that, that's his first kill. And it's a passion kill. But I believe that it was probably pretty. Uh, it was probably pretty planned in a weird way, anyways. But after that, he starts unraveling because he really enjoys it. Like he enjoys killing, and he's just a really, really bad dude. Yes, absolutely. Now you got but, yeah. some. You got. I was going to say, yeah. like with Katie, so she escapes and runs to the police station. They get her in, they question her, they get the location of where this crime is supposed to have happened. Police show up, not a sign of foul play. 
guy saying he's sleeping. And now you start realizing what the money um, can do of a corrupt senator and, and, what, and, and what power and what pull they have uh, on that level. So I thought it was a, a fun thing to look at um, with that thing. But she looks like she's crazy because she's claiming of this crime and uh, suddenly there's no crime. And then uh, this girl is, so to speak, missing, but they're getting a text message saying that she's blowing off steam and she's heading to Mexico and she's going to, you know, just take a couple of weeks off. So everybody's thinking that she's crazy uh, when she's really telling the truth of what happened. And it takes a while to get there. Um, and obviously there, there's lots of setups for that to go wrong. Um, but it's, it's, it's definitely a fun, uh, fun ride. That movie has done incredibly well on Tubi. That thing has uh, been trending day in and day out for six months, I feel. Well, you did Bennett's song, and I guess you got a follow-up here called a Bennett song holiday. I noticed yeah. that you got cursed, uh, Corbin Burson in, in there. I met him at Comic-Con 2019 in Toronto, and I have a story about him. Oh, wow. Be because uh, I've never had him on the show. Uh -huh. um, I'd love to get him, but I'm, um, I'm going to tell you um, – I like the horror cons a lot more than other cons because I find mm. the community and the connection is so much uh, tighter. Yeah. But I'm going to tell you, when I went to uh, Comic-Con in Toronto, I had a great time, but there were two guests there that really stood out to me, you know. One mm. was uh, John Rhys Davies from Raiders of the Lost Ark. And the other was Corbin Burson. <laughs> And I remember Corbin, um, not only was he a great guy to mm -hmm. meet, I got my picture taken with him and a signed picture. But I, I remember he was learning, his, his handler was teaching him how to do selfies. And oh, yeah. um, he was, uh, had his handler there. He's like, I can get used to this. I never did this before. <laughs> um, is he as fun a guy to work with as he was just to meet? Yeah, he is a riot. Uh, very intelligent guy, very funny, um, and very real. Like he's uh, he's not Hollywood nice and 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 pretend like like he's like a regular. Like he's the kind. Of, if 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 I was gonna say uh, the people that you'd love to have a beer with, he's like in my top five because he's just a good dude. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it was funny because when we watched. Bennett's song holiday we had an online premiere of it and we all watched it together and 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 he never asked to see it before so when we so when we watched it together for that virtual premiere mm -hmm. um it was funny because he's like harley this is a like you should have probably toned me down a little bit because my character is pretty feisty and i'm like i like that about it i, I like the fact that your character is you know, not PG. I like that he's PG-13. I like it. You know what I mean? I like that he pushes the envelope. I like that he's edgy. And he goes, all right, all right. I wasn't sure. I thought maybe this was more for kids. But he said, uh, uh, that character, though, that, uh, that was something else. I didn't realize how harsh he came, he came across. And I'm like, yep, he definitely did. Well, you got completed here, but I don't see a cast list. United Colors of Bennett songs. That's actually the same film. Oh, uh, was we it? retitled the film. Uh, the distributor retitled the film. And, uh, and, and that was the original Bennett song film that for some reason they can't. IMDb can be a little clumsy sometimes. Mm -hmm. uh, somehow that uh, because we had uh, two different festival uh, entries. Uh, that film stayed with the same title because we entered uh, festivals with it. Uh, it stuck that way, and I don't know how to get it off. But that is the Bennett Song movie. Well, uh, some other projects. Go. You tell me what you can or cannot talk about with these films, because some of these yeah. are either completed or pre-production, and if there's stuff you can't talk about, just let me know. But we got sure. Ash, Ash and Bone. Yeah, Ash and Bone, we are just uh, kind of at the tail end of the festival run. 
We are signing with a distributor this week. So finally, this movie will be released pretty soon. Um, but it's done incredibly well at film festivals. Um, one of the more prestigious festivals in Europe, uh, Fright Night in Austria, took mm -hmm. us in. We screened uh, as a screening finalist there. We were screening finalists at Atlanta Horror. We were screening finalists at the uh, Terror and Bay, a Fright mm -hmm. Night in Kentucky. This film has been doing absolutely incredible. And what's been cool is I've been able to go to most of these screenings and sit in the in the audience to, to see the reactions. Mm -hmm. And people are really, really digging it. And I, I wasn't sure... Um, that it was the right time because the ash and bone is it's a it's a retro to the early 2000s and that's not so far gone so i never knew but this was one of my influences i love um you know house of wax texas chainsaw massacre uh the hills have eyes those type of movies that i really really like that backyard uh hillbilly crazies um fascinated me uh so i wanted to tackle a version of something like that so i talked to my uh, my friend uh, and writer uh, brett miller mm -hmm. and uh, we had this conversation about this story and and uh, he just wrote a, an incredible script and and i believe um you know i i, I took a, a step back on a writer on that one because i really wanted to do a horror film that the horror community would really embrace and take in. Um, and I feel like we might've might pulled that off. I, obviously we will wait to see what the, what the audience say, but uh, so far at the festivals, this thing is cleaning up and, and, uh, and people are loving it. We were a screening finalist at the Minefield as well, which is a, a big festival in uh, New Mexico. So, yeah, it's it's been a it's been a wild ride, and I can't wait to see it. Jamie Bernadette puts in uh, an incredible performance, um, and then uh, Mel Novak, who is uh, uh, from Bruce Lee's Game of Death, uh, actually also has the same manager as me. I've worked with him a few times before, but his performance in Ash and Bone is really special. Um, he gets he gets that David Lynch feel character. Oh, nice. uh, where he's that mysterious, you don't really know who he is, and, and you're trying to figure out, is he in on this? Is he a part of this? You know, wh wh who is this guy? Um, fantastic job by, by everybody on board. Um, I, I think this movie probably could break us mainstream for real, um, but we'll see. The, jur the jury's out, so uh, uh, by going based on the festival's, it feels like the right time. Talk about your uh, wife working in this one. We actually uh, play a married couple for the first time. Oh, uh, must have been so, nice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was uh, a lot of fun. And we essentially, uh, we play, uh, I play a character, uh, Lucas Vanderbilt, that uh, uh, his wife died of cancer and he ended up meeting and, and, and falling in love with a younger woman he has a, a, a 17 year old daughter who's kind of rebelling and fighting him. And, uh, and he thinks I'm going to take them up North to where I spent my summers as a kid. I'm going to see if, if a change of environment and some family time can't fix things. Um, and uh, when they go up there, things go really, really bad, but it's, it's, it's a really good story and it was fun to play husband and wife for sure um because they're, they're they're a good couple well we have uh in post production we have uh beneath us all you yeah. are you able to talk about that one yeah i can talk about it i, I literally uh, the most visual spectacle we have ever done uh this is a it's a vampire movie Okay. And we rebooted the the original vampire here, uh, so to speak. Our Dracula uh, is a Viking. So when the film starts, it starts in Viking times, and and we get to see essentially him becoming. Uh, in this case, the Vikings get him into a coffin and ship him across the Atlantic, uh, and then uh, this young girl 
is out in the woods and uh, she finds this, this, this uh, thing calls her and she essentially comes up, she unearths him. He's been starving for 1200 years. So when he gets out of there, he barely even knows what he is. And she essentially takes a liking to him and takes him home and puts him up in the barn, which is obviously a big mistake because he's not going to forget who he is forever. Uh, but this is a fantastic uh, vampire story. Um, I have uh, Sean Whalen, which is going to be hilarious for all the interviews for this film. You have Harley Wallen and Sean Whalen, and people get our name wrong all the time already. So that's going to be fun. <laughs> but he was incredible. You um, get Maria uh, Olson. Maria Olson was incredible. I'll tell you, the performances from Sean, Maria, and Jan were literally breathtaking. And I couldn't even think that we were going to have that good of a show. But then you have even our local. So Angelina, who's, who plays the lead in, in Ash and Bone, is also one of the main characters in this one. Both her and Katie lay down epic performances as far as I'm concerned. I'm really curious uh, about this one. I think the last really great uh, vampire horror film to me is probably 30 Days of Night. Um, and, and we're due for another one. And I'm hoping this can take uh, the place. It's got suspense. It has horror. Uh, we went uh, with this continuously evolving vampire, uh, meaning that he doesn't stop at just fangs. He's uh, like a creature vampire when he comes to his his full power before he he's gone, so to speak. It, it, it's a uh, the same thing again. Brett Miller wrote just a, an amazing script uh, to make us take the journey. And like I said, visually, we've never touched anything on this. We had a new gaffer, Andy Westra, who just blew my mind with the lighting for this film. Uh, I think uh, I, I think we're setting brand new bars on this one. Uh, and it doesn't hurt that we have a, a really nice ensemble cast. Yeah. Well, my, my favorite uh, vampire film is the original Fright Night. That's my favorite. Oh, it's so good. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's very good. Yeah, but but think about it, though. Bram Stoker's Dracula. Uh, you have uh, The Lost Boys. You have 30 Days of Night. You have Fright Night. You have uh, uh, Let the Right One In. Uh, after that, it's kind of hard to come up with a really good vampire movie that's done in the last... 20 30 years so i really felt that i wanted to touch on on a great vampire I'm, story I'm, I'm just glad you didn't say twilight <laughs> <laughs> there, well i'm sure twilight's more for the for the teeny boppers right <laughs> now um this was an interesting discovery last night when i was researching you you get a film in pre-production called finding nicole I have interviewed Kelly Maroney, oh, and cool. um, I got a signed copy of Chopping Mall and three beautiful autographed pictures of her here that uh, I've never met her, but I did this uh, through Facebook with her, and um, yeah, and uh, I've interviewed Kelly. I'm still somewhat in touch with her, and uh, um. I love the fact you go get to work with her because I've, I've ever since Fast Times at Ridgemont High, I always liked her. Yeah. Talk about getting her involved with this. Yeah, no, she's fantastic. She came to a couple of my premieres and uh, and I, I wanted to work with her. She's got great presence. She's such a good spirit uh, and she's a really talented actress. So I, I've been wanting to do this for a while. Um, and I just found this perfect opportunity. Finding Nicole is going to be a very different thing for us. It's, uh, it's a true story of uh, a woman that went through literally hell to still be here with us today. And, um, and, and, and we get a chance to tell her story to the world. And, and it's fascinating. And, and, and Kelly's super uh, excited to be a part of it. And, and, and we've been due to work on something together Ever since I believe the, I saw it. She came to my Betrayed premiere and Eternal Code premiere, and we talked. and I and and uh, I'm I'm very big on fit uh, 
as a character thing. So when I cast, you know, I don't just give people a role because they're a star. Um, I wanted the right role so that she could really excel and be, you know, something that takes your breath away when you sit down in the movie theater. And I think uh, this is a really good role for her. It's, it's, a, uh, it's a fantastic opportunity, I think, for all of us just to tell this story. Uh, the, what Nicole went through, nobody should, should have to deal with, uh, d- you know, domestic violence is, uh, is kind of a, a very silent killer in our country. And, and I think from seeing everything uh, from working with Nicole and her uh, Enough Initiative to see how, how common it is that husbands kill their wives and that husbands try to kill their wives and how, 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 how common that is, is really jarring to me. Uh, to realize that 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 we have this in our society, and I love what Nicole is doing. She's out there teaching women to look for the red flags and the signs that somebody might not be uh, fully healthy to be with. Uh, mm-hmm. And she also teaches the young the young men uh, so that they can look within themselves and maybe fix things themselves, so that they don't have to walk around with so much anger and insecurities and whatever it is that triggers that kind of behavior. But uh, in in all honesty, as as a former professional fighter, uh, you know, I I remember just doing rounds with women when it came to kickboxing. And it's hard for a guy to even just put a, put a, put a glove on a woman at the fact that we have people that are, you know, doing this to, to women is, is really scary and it's really sad. And I, I really want us to tackle this and, and make a change. So that's the goal with that film is to create a lot more awareness so that Nicole's work, especially through the Enough Initiative, will get a greater uh, audience so that we can tackle and make some impact on this because it, it just shouldn't happen. Uh, just shouldn't happen. Yeah, I, I like Kelly. Yep. Um, do you have a, a website and any charities that you want to plug on here? The charity would be the Enough Initiative, uh, Nicole's uh, charity. Uh, we are very much in support of her. Uh, mm-hmm. And uh, and that's a big thing for us. Uh, I don't have websites uh, in these days with social media. We put everything on Facebook and Instagram and so on. So that's where you'll find us. You can either just look for Harley Wallen um, or Katie Wallen, uh, or or, uh, if you want to follow our production company, it's called Painted Creek Productions. um, And that's a a good place, especially if you want to follow our our productions, our our films. That's a great place to go. Um, And our TV series uh, just launched on Tubi, two months ago and it's been one of the top rated uh, tv shows on tubi for almost three months now yeah it's, I got it's a wild ride it's called tale of tales i don't know if you had a chance to check that out yet tale of tales no i have not no i actually don't have television you know i just watch mm-hmm. my blu-rays that's why i'm i'm, I'm familiar with uh, uh a lot of your work but again yeah didn't stop me from having you on here because like yeah. i said i i'm open to that that doesn't scare yeah. me yeah uh you've got some stuff on here i definitely would like to check out you know so yeah. um yeah a lot but, of it's on tubi and tubi is free so oh, is it, uh, it gives okay. you an opportunity yeah it gives you an opportunity to watch it uh, streaming and you don't have to pay subscription services So Tubi has become one of our, we didn't even really know about it. And uh, a couple of my films got placed on Tubi and they started doing really well. So now I have five of my films are on Tubi and our TV series also landed on Tubi. Originally it was a Tubi exclusive, uh, but we are, we're, we're, we're spreading it now. So it's going to go to Amazon, IMDb TV and, uh, and uh, Vudu and all the other places. But, uh, uh, Tubi is a really cool place. Uh, I dig it. Uh, 85 million monthly users and, and free. Okay. You don't oh. even have to sign in. You can watch it anonymously, so to speak. Okay. I did not know that. Okay. I'll yeah. have to look into that. Yeah. Because now, um, if Katie is up for it, um, 
I can uh, have her on here either this weekend or next week sometime if she's up for it. Yeah. Oh, I'm sure she is. Yep. Yeah. We're heading, we're heading back to LA, uh, middle of November. Mm -hmm. uh, she got nominated for best actress with Hollywood global. So, uh, we're heading out there in case she gets one of those big golden statues coming out of there. But yes, it's for the, the TV series, Tale of Tales. Okay. Um, it's, a it's a cool project. Uh, we, uh, it takes place primarily inside of a strip club. And uh, the, the premise of the whole thing is I play this uh, guy who owns and runs the strip club mm -hmm. who is not like a, an honest upfront guy. He, he's got his dealings uh, probably a little bit of Sopranos background. Uh, and, and then Katie plays uh, an officer and uh, the sister of a missing stripper, which causes obviously major rifts uh, between the police department and the strip club and, and all of the connections uh, throughout. It's a really good ride. We've, uh, we've probably never had something um, have that strong of a rating on IMDb uh, and same thing like I said on Tubi we were we were trending as one of their very top shows for a good two months okay yeah well I go to Toronto for uh, Frightmare in the Falls I'll be there from October 28th till November 4th so yep. I've got time before then to have her on or yeah. uh when I come back, but uh, if you guys are going to be away in November, I got, because um, I'm getting booked up this week, but I could do this weekend or I could do uh, Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesday yeah. next week. Yeah. Yeah. I'll, con I'll connect you to, uh, and, and uh, you guys can figure out uh, the, the schedule. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that sounds good. Uh, she, uh, I know she's pretty excited about heading to LA because I won. Uh, best tv show for that same tv show mm -hmm. um at their uh at the, they their big new festival i think they're only i think they're three years old but they're it's a it's a festival that's uh, kind of worldwide so they have they have events all over the all, all over the place and uh and uh it's going to be pretty cool to go back down there but I, i'm sure she'll have time before then okay um, perfect to, to link up Okay. And uh, Lorreen uh, Landon is another one. I'll connect too. you guys too. Yeah. Yeah. Because I know yeah, Lorreen is awesome. You'll like her. She's, she's cool. Got, she's got some films dating way back that uh, yeah. I'd love to talk to her about. So, yeah, I would like that. So, um, and uh, get the spotlight on uh, your films. I'm going to ask you a tough question here, though. Okay. What film have you made that you're the most proud of? Oh, God. <laughs> I, so that's a tricky question because you can be proud for different things mm -hmm. um the last two between ash and bone and beneath us all mm -hmm. i think finally it felt like everything came together everyone's performance all the way around was so strong that i it was like it kind of took my breath away on set. And, um, and that was fascinating to me. So, so, so those are definitely up there, but I will say as of right now, the TV series is probably what I'm most proud of because we shot two thirds of that season one during COVID. And that is not easy. We went a whole summer of shooting and had zero spread um, with nobody getting uh, infected. We actually had one of our PAs get infected and we got her out uh, uh, so that she wasn't coming in and, and you know, affecting other people. But essentially we shot um, you know, three months of content on an independent budget uh, without having spread and, and that that I'm really proud of that we took it serious enough to make sure that people were safe and healthy um, and the and the end result the fact that we're getting the kind of praises and, the, and awards that we're getting it is definitely it feels good after putting that kind of work in because that was a beast 
we we started shooting um, February first of twenty twenty, and essentially got shut down a month and a half later, and then we were sitting around waiting for three and a half months uh, for us to be able to safely get back again. We followed all the SAG uh, after our recommendations and added a couple of things ourselves uh, in order to pull it off. But we were nervous. I'm not going to lie. It was pretty, pretty scary to, to, to even attempt that. And then we pulled it off. And then all the things that happened in post, um, you know, I ended up getting uh, Randy Lynch and Alan Lynch to score the series. Those two are, are a fantastic label. So I ended up getting incredible music. I mean, we have Twisted making music. In our, like, it's just amazing to have big, big recording artists, you know, with 50 million views on their music videos, uh, have their songs in our TV series. And uh, it was just the beginning of something else. So I, if I had to pick one, I'd say Tale of Tales, probably the most proud I've been uh, because we did a whole lot on a very, uh, very modest budget. Okay. All right. Well, you know what? It was wonderful having you come on here today. A special thanks to Joe uh, Williamson for connecting us. And uh, like I said, dude, you've got some stuff on here that I've got to check out. I'm yeah. always looking for new stuff. So, uh, and connect me with Katie. Yeah. And, um, and Lorraine. And Lorraine. And maybe even sometime down the line, I'll have you and Katie on here together. Yeah. Yeah. But first yeah, we I, enjoy we enjoy doing shows together. So that'd mm -hmm. be fun. Yeah. We like poking, we like poking fun at each other. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, I'm going to do a solo with her first. And then yeah. uh, later on, I'm going to get the two of you on here together. Um, so that uh I can get a feel of that dynamic. Yeah. So yeah. So that should give you uh a little bit of advertisement for your uh filmography. Yeah, no, I appreciated it. It's one of the things that I, I like to say this whenever I'm on an interview and I must say thank you to you too, Greg. Mm -hmm. um, it, a lot of people take stuff for granted. I'm not one of them. To the fact that anybody is going to watch my show or my movie when there's a million other stuff uh, films out there, uh, I, I appreciate it. I really do because Look, uh, Harley, anyone taking their time. Look, Harley, I'm nobody in the thick of things. So when somebody says to me, uh, like Joe, would you do an interview with Harley Whalen or Wallen? I didn't know who you was, but you know how many people I've had come on here? I didn't know who they were. And I yeah. look at their filmography and I would still be able to like, for example, looking at your filmography last night, I noticed your wife was, I didn't even know she was your wife until, uh, I investigated it and I was yeah. like, okay, there's a connection. And I discovered uh, Lorraine Landon uh, mm -hmm. and she had a filmography and like, I like um, all these people I brought up tonight or today, I didn't know who they were, but it's yeah. like, okay, uh, this person's in a lot of these films. Let's get this story. Let's get this story. There's always opportunity. Um, and I've had this uh, issue with uh, another podcaster. I, I won't. I won't name who it is. Who will not interview people he does not know. And I'm like, huh. but I'm like, if uh, I'm t if I take that away from people, because you have no idea how many times I've tried to interview a name. Yeah, yeah. Who wouldn't come on my show because they didn't know who I was. Yeah. And that doesn't feel nice. Yeah. So I don't want to treat other people that way either. So, yeah. Um, yeah. So I was happy to have you on here and uh, look at your filmography. And yes, I'm going to check it out. And um, I'll have Katie on whenever you connect me with her and I'll get that yeah. set up and with Lorraine and I'll get that set up and uh, we'll get more uh, eyes on your projects. I appreciate that. Yeah. No, this is this has been fun. I'm glad glad I was able to get you on here today. And again, thanks to Joe Williamson for connecting yeah. us. Yep. Yeah, yep. Joe's the man. I, I get I get to go hang out with him again next month. I was just in for uh, 
for 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 my last trip with my award and now we're heading back there again and then probably ashton bone i would guess probably a big la premiere when we kick off the theatrical march april maybe now was that behind you is that one of the cages that was in that movie you had no the other oh. side no, but that, that's my dogs. My dogs have their cages. But those were the kind of cages we used. I kept seeing that and I was like, hmm. That's where I keep my wife. <laughs> Ooh, don't tell her that. <laughs> oh, she knows I'm a jokester. She yeah. she uh, she won't get a she won't get get offended. She'll well, poke right back at me. I love that. That's a sign of a great relationship. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We're a good team, man. We're a really good team. Well, you know what? Uh, do you have anything else you want to plug on here before we close off? Uh, I think we're good. The only thing is uh, I will share this with you um, and you can choose uh, if you want to have this in there or not, but I just got my newest script from my writer and we are going to shoot it this winter. And literally, I have never read a script this good. Katie Gobi in it? Yep. Pressure is on. And yeah, the role was written for her by Brett. Because Brett saw her performance in Ash and Bone and then in Tale of Tales. And now in, in Beneath Us All, he came on set. And he goes, you know, we should do something where we can kind of push her because she's really coming into her own. Uh, yeah. She, it's pretty wild because, you know, when you start making films and you, and you uh, put your wife in your movie, so to speak, there are some people that are going to be like, Oh, she's getting roles because she's his wife. First things first, she's also the producer. So number so one, not, De, Palma, it's, it's, De Palma did that with uh, Nancy Allen and I oh, love yeah. Nancy Allen, you know, I, yeah. You know what? I think it's a good idea. You get to spend time with your significant other and mm. uh, you're not always in each other's face through the production mm. and you get, you get to do something together that you're passionate about. I, I, I don't care for people making those judgments. I heard about oh, Rob, yeah. Zom Rob Zombie and Sherry. Yeah, Rose he Zombie. gets grilled too. But you know what? I love seeing Sher. Number one, she's gorgeous. Of course, yeah. I love to see her. You know, yeah. uh, I mean, well, I'm but, like. But but the thing is, if 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 I opened up an Ace Hardware, and she ran it with me, nobody would say anything. No. Nope. And the funny thing is, for some reason, when it's a movie, now suddenly somebody's going to have input on it. And, and what's funny is, out of everybody that's been in our films, the most awarded person as an actor is her. She has won more acting award than all of the other people. So, so she's good. And what people don't know because she, she doesn't walk around and brag about it, but her sister has five Emmys. Um, she grew up in a, in, a, in a family with film and, and everything else. She was a part of her sister's thesis films in film school. Um, she's a trained actress that's trained, uh, you know, uh, to, to be here so she's earned every bit that she's gotten and uh and uh, you know uh, uh again she is she's nothing but an amazing asset when it comes to our films and uh, i say keep casting her keep yep. casting her you know absolutely keep casting her um i i've got no issue with that uh, i would question if you didn't have her in a film yeah so. especially a professional actress and not use her. That makes no sense. Although, are you, you going to have Kelly in this new one? Huh? You going to have Kelly Maroney in this new one? Uh, the, in Finding Nicole. We, the new, new, new one, I don't know who's going to be playing anything yet. Uh, I literally, I literally just completed reading it this weekend. I always like seeing more Kelly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Kelly's awesome. Uh, if, yeah. if there's an opportunity... Uh, trust me, I'll find it. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, you know what? Thank you so much uh, for coming on here today and uh, talking with me. I had a lot of fun with this. Yeah. Um, when this is ready, I'll, I'll uh, send you the link to it and you could put it up wherever you want to. And uh, yeah, connect with Caitlin and Lorraine and uh, I'll uh, do those ones. And uh, yeah.
Yeah, that sounds fun. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, before I let you go, would you mind doing a plug for my show? Sure. What do you want? Just state your name and uh, say you're uh, tuned in to Greg Gilbert on Python's Paradise. I am Harley Wallen, and you are tuned in to Greg. What was your last name? Gilbert. <laughs> Gilbert. Greg Gilbert on Python's Paradise. Okay. I am Harley Wallen, and you are tuned in to uh, Greg Gilbert's Python Paradise. Absolutely. And uh, we're going to see more of Harley Wallen in the future. And uh, I'm definitely going to dig in uh, deeper to your uh, filmography. I'm going to check some of these out. And uh, thank Tubi, you. Tubi, you said so. Yeah, great spot. I, I have five of my films are on there. And I just talked to uh, my uh, distributor uh, for Betrayed, uh, which is held by Sony and Vision. And they said, because I told them, I said, we got to, if you don't have it on network anymore, um, then let's get it on Tubi. So I, I told them to, 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 so hopefully pretty soon uh, Betrayed will be added as well um, to, to check out there. Perfect. Perfect. Well, I bid you a good day. Thank you so much for the honor. Thanks, Greg. No problem. Appreciate it. We'll be in touch. Awesome. Thank you. Take care. You too. Yeah. Bye-bye.